But turn to Psalms 8, and we'll read that this time. Psalms 8. O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth, who hast set thy glory above the heavens. Out of the mouth of babes and sucklings hast thou ordained strength because of thine enemies, that thou mightest still the enemy and the avenger. When I consider thy heavens, the work of thy fingers, the moon and the stars which thou hast ordained, what is man that thou art mindful of him? And the son of man that thou visiteth him. For thou hast made him a little lower than the angels, and hast crowned him with glory and honor. Thou madest him to have dominion over the works of, the, of thy hands. Thou hast put all things under his feet, all sheep and oxen, yea, and the beasts of the field, the fowl of the air, and the fish of the sea, and whatsoever passes through the pass of the sea. O Lord our God, how excellent is thy name in all the earth. Thanks. Good morning and a Christian greetings to you. It's good to be here with you this morning. Thanks for the invitation to come worship with you. It's been a good experience so far. And uh, I'm sure the Lord will be with us here as we continue. This is not my first time to Lancaster County, but it's uh, definitely interesting again. I've been here a few times before. There's still some things that, it take that uh, I'm not quite used to yet. Things like the traffic. I'm from Georgia, live in the country, and so I'm not used to having lots of obstacles right on the road, but that's okay. Uh, we made out. We'd, my wife and I have a little joke, though, about Pennsylvania driving, uh, so, but uh, we'll leave that story. Here at the beginning, I would like to quote three scriptures. The first two will be about a message that we're receiving, and the third one will detail the importance of that message. The first scripture is found in Psalm 19.1. The heavens declare the glory of God, and the firmament showeth his handiwork. There is a specific part of God's creation that has a very specific role and that is to explicitly declare God's glory. Psalm 97, 6 is the next one. The heavens declare his righteousness, and all the people see his glory. So the heavens are declaring God's righteous, not, righteousness, not only his power, his creative ability, his majesty, his beauty, his strength. It does all those things, as we'll see later on. But also his righteousness. How, how can... The universe declare God's righteousness. We think of righteousness as purity, holiness. And what does the universe have to do with that? Well, we have the, uh, the issue of the heavens being created in a right way. Right is the root word for righteous, of course. So God is continuously working in the state of being right. And... He is definitely a righteous God, and that's visible in the heavens. The next, the next scripture that we'll look at is Romans chapter 1, verse 20. For the invisible things of him from the creation of the world are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even his eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. Now, that to me underscores the importance of this message that the creation is bringing us, specifically the heavens, the universe around us, because it's holding us without excuse. So let's, let's just say that we, uh, we just, for a minute, forget about the message that we have in the Scriptures here. Of course, we don't want to permanently forget about that, but just disregard this for a minute and think of it, that the creation itself holds us without excuse. So this service this morning... Thank you. Will be slightly different than normal. We will look at the revelation of our God as seen in creation. Now, this is a message that's superseded by what we find in the scriptures, of course. But if this is such an important message, it would do us, to, do us good to take a look at it this morning and this evening to see what we can find 
about our Creator. To give you a little introduction to this and to my interest in astronomy, I will go ahead with that here at the beginning and get that out of the way. Pardon me while I talk about myself for a minute. I want to talk about God, but we'll get to that soon. I was told that it would be good if I would give an introduction of how I started my interest in astronomy and started speaking about this, I believe. So if we back up 10 years, I started to speak about astronomy in churches, at seminars, reunions, homeschool conventions, conferences of various sorts. And so I've been doing that for a while here. But the way that started was there was a minister in our church there in Montezuma that knew I had an interest in astronomy and had studied it. And so he asked if I would give a short devotional or a topic at a church picnic of ours. So I did that. But the way I actually started the interest in astronomy, the way that got kick-started, was tied in with tragedy. Uh, it happened back when I was five years old. My dad worked in a partnership on a dairy farm with his brothers and their dad. And I spent a lot of time up on the dairy farm with daddy. We of course, we had a lot of work to do, and I would tag along behind him, try to help him where I could. There was one Sunday afternoon, however, that I stayed at home, and I didn't go with him. All four of my sisters went with him to the farm. They were doing the chores and milking the cows that afternoon. We got a call from my uncle, whose name was Harley, and he said that we needed to come up to the farm as soon as possible because Daddy was attacked by the farm bull. So, of course, we got in the car, drove across the road, went to the farm, and there was, there was lots of emergency vehicles around, flashing lights and sirens. This scared me because I knew this happened to my daddy. That's what all this commotion was about. We got to the barn. The bullpen was behind the barn, and there was a group of men standing there keeping people back from going to the, the scene of the accident. It was too traumatic. They kept a mom back. They wouldn't let her go back there. But I was young enough, small enough, and concerned enough about my daddy that I slipped through the cracks and I went back there anyway. And what I saw, I'll never forget. The image is burned in my mind of the paramedics there propping him up against the block wall. He was conscious, but just barely, barely clinging to consciousness. The paramedics tried to get him to respond to them, but the best he could do was just mumble back to them incoherently. So, of course, they got the stretcher. They put him out on the stretcher. They wheeled him into the ambulance, and they took him away. And I never saw him alive again after that. And he was taken away from me in just one afternoon, so traumatically. And, and I was left with this image of him being propped up against the block wall and looked like he was completely bloodied from head to toe. His clothes were soaked with blood. And he was so vulnerable there, but yet he was my hero and he was my father figure. And he was so important to me. And I loved him so much. I have actually, looking back on his life, I have lots of good memories of him and absolutely no negative memories whatsoever. He wasn't a perfect man. I'm sure he did things to me and to us in the family that were less than ideal, but possibly because of God blocking some memories, I have no negative memories of him whatsoever. He was a good daddy for me, and I couldn't understand why a good God would let a bad bull kill my daddy and take him away like that. When they brought the body back, and I looked in the casket, I didn't want to do it anymore because it bothered me too much to see my daddy laying there looking just as dead as those dead cows that him and I had dragged off to the pit and dropped over the edge to be forgotten forever. So I somewhat, I became somewhat reclusive because I felt insecure without my daddy, without my father figure. He was my hero. And as time went on, well, let me back up just a little. Three days after the accident, which was actually today, 25 years ago, they lowered my daddy into a pit and covered him up, and I'll never see his body again. 
And as I went on from that point without him, it was difficult for me. I became bitter as a child without realizing even what bitterness was. But my family was con concerned about the way that I reacted to the accident. And I remember, go remember going back to school. There was a number of churches going to our school, similar to your school situation here. And there was, I didn't know the other boys very well because I had just started about a month before that, a little over a month before that is when I started first grade. I remember seeing a group of boys off to the side and hearing them talking about this man that got killed by the bull. And they were talking about it in such a casual and flippant way that it just sent daggers into my heart. They weren't respecting my daddy. And then they were trying to figure out who this man was. And one of them saw me standing over there by myself. And he pointed at me and he said it was his daddy. And it singled me out and made me feel once again like I was alone. And that I was different now. I didn't have a daddy to take me hunting, to take me fishing, to go along with to work. Time went on and I felt like there was an ominous, foreboding sense of emptiness within me, and the whole world had kind of taken on a, just a, a darker feel because my daddy wasn't there. Now, I don't want to over-sensationalize this, but th those are just some of the feelings that I went through after the loss. And I got a little older. A year went by, close to two years. Around two years later, I came to the point that I was hearing these stories about God and His goodness and the miracles that He can perform and the way that He can answer prayers and He has such a great deal of love for His people. And I wanted to believe that. I was told that all things work together for good to those that love God, even if we have bad things happen to us. And I would also go outside at night, look up into the heavens, and I would see that vast expanse and it's, the stars are so unique and so significant in their own right. And they're so far away from us that when I would look up into the universe and really consider what I was seeing, the stars were so far away from me they would completely destroy my depth perception, making so I couldn't tell how far they are, leaving me feeling like I was lost in the middle of nowhere yet surrounded by everything at once. And it has that same effect on the rest of us if we actually consider what we're seeing. And so it spoke of a greatness and a power, and I knew that the Creator created those things, and I knew that I was told that He also loves us. And it felt like something, that entity, would be something to fill the emptiness in my heart that was left when Daddy was taken. And so I started thinking that this God could take care of me, and in my own childlike way, I made a deal with God. Now, I'm not advocating making deals with God because we serve Him on His own terms. But in my young, innocent, childlike way, I told God I wanted to accept what He allowed to happen to me in taking my, allowing my father to be taken away. If He would simply do something on His part, come and be a father for me. wasn't asking for a conversion experience, but simply was asking for a new daddy is what it was, honestly. A few, few years later, I came to know Christ as my Savior as well. But this was just simply asking God to be my new daddy, and I was so excited to see him do that. I, was, I got to the point where I would pray to God, and he would answer my prayers. He's, he's so faithful to answer the, the, the prayer of faith from a child. And I was so, it got to the point that I was so confident of His presence with me that if something would excite me through the day, I would just talk to God about it. If something would frighten me or scare me, I would just talk to God about it, just like I would have ordinarily spoken with my earthly father. And so through this, I was developing a relationship with God that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to otherwise. And He was, of course, faithful to me as I went on through life, never... I haven't always kept that good relationship with him, but I've always been able to see him as clearly as a father as well as a powerful creator. So as, as I go outside at night and I look up into the heavens, those things up there hold a special uh, value to me because they were created by my father. And as a young child, I realized that 
My earthly father went up there somewhere, so was another association that I had there. So these things were a triggering mechanism in my interest in astronomy. And it highlights the scripture that we read. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. We can't always understand why God allows these things to happen to us, but we realize as looking back that God's ways are best and he's weaving this grand uh, tapestry of the threads of our life into something that will be beautiful in the end. I couldn't understand why God let the bull kill my daddy, but today I look back and I see the value of building a relationship with God, something he allowed me to have a new opportunity to do that I wouldn't have had the opportunity to otherwise. And he's also laid on my heart to, to share the message that we see about him in the heavens. So that was kind of my introduction to astronomy. As I grew older, I, I voraciously read books and and uh, got all the material I could on astronomy. I had telescopes, so I studied in a variety of ways. I have no formal education, though, however, besides the normal schooling that I had in astronomy, no formal education beyond grade school. So it's basically self-taught, so I'm not an authority in these things. And because of this meaningful personal experience, in coming to astronomy, I do not ex appreciate the secular attempt to hijack astronomy away from its creator and even attempt to use it against him. That's happening today in, a, in, a, in such a, a pronounced way, and it's, it's really bothersome to me because the, the, the universe is a declaration of God's glory. But, and this starting, this was starting with the Age of Enlightenment, when men started to, hide, to lift up their own reason and started to rebel against the, 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 author, the authority of their day, their contemporary authorities, which, of course, the most prominent of those would have been the figure of God himself. And so they started to lift up human reasoning, and they tried to push God out of the picture. And it's interesting that coinciding with that time, God allowed man to start pulling back the curtains, pulling back the drapes on the creation in the universe around us. And this is telling us a great deal about him. These, astronomicals, these ast astronomical discoveries that are co coinciding with the Age of Enlightenment give us the uh, knowledge of how big the sun is, for one thing. The sun is enormously large. We could place over 100 Earths across the face of the sun. We could place 1.3 million Earths inside the sun. Uh, just earlier this year, I was in Atlanta with some street witnessing that we were doing. Our church there, home church, had gone to Atlanta. And I took one of my telescopes along, and I, I set it there right beside the sidewalk, and I put it on the sun. I projected an image of the sun on the back screen. And normally, when we stand there passing out tracks and things, people will hardly look at you if you get someone to walk close to you, you're doing really good. If you get someone to actually glance up at you, you're doing even better. And if they stick their hand out to accept the track, you've done it. But with this telescope, they would walk by and they would look. Some would pass by on the other side. Others, and quite a few, would come over and see what's going on here. And I'd show them the picture of the sun and I'd talk to them about it, how that it's 1.3 million times larger than the earth in volume. And this sunspot here on the sun is actually about the size of the earth. And the sun is giving off such a great deal of energy that it's losing about 4 million tons of mass every second. As it converts through nu nuclear energy, it converts mass into energy. And it loses another 1.5 million tons every second in coronal mass ejections and solar flares and the like. And so as they were thinking about these things, I'd tell them, I'd ask them a few questions. What do you think about how this sun actually got there. Where did this thing come from? You know, it's so massive and so powerful. And it was interesting to see the response. Some of them would say, well, you know, I, I think because of my faith in God that 
Um, this was probably something that, that the Creator actually put there. And, and I could tell they were hesitant. I, would never, I wouldn't talk about God until I'd ask, after I'd asked those questions. And so it seemed like some of them were hesitant to bring out what they thought about this because of the secular establishment telling us over and over again that these things didn't come from God. They came from some Big Bang explosion. But I would, of course, quickly reassure them that I thought they were exactly right. Others would say, well, I think it must have come from a, a nebulous cloud that started to coalesce and uh, came together. Where did the nebulous cloud come from? Well, it's, uh, you know, they, they, they would sometimes have answers that could keep going, but usually not. Because we keep going back to the origin of matter and there's a dead end. And so it was a tremendous witnessing opportunity to show these people the power of God through what we see in astronomy. There's trillions of stars. There's a vastness out there. Uh, there's tremendous power of God in, displayed in astronomy. For example, we have, I think I'll have to leave that for later if we have time. We're running out of time this morning, but that's okay. Let's move on here to looking at the two fundamental questions that astronomers or cosmologists cannot answer. And, of course, biologists as well would be included in this about the origin of life. They can't be answered or the origin of things without God. And these two questions, these two things are the origin of matter and the origin of life. The origin of matter cannot be described or explained without God, neither can the origin of life. I want to start here with the physical makeup of man. If I can get this to work here. Scientists have discovered that the human body is comprised of about 28 base and trace elements. All of them are found in the earth. And this is just an interesting confirmation of what we find in Genesis chapter 2, verse 7. And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Man was made from the dust of the earth. And so, but we have to... Uh, we have to wonder what is life actually? What, is, what, is it in, uh, what does it entail? Well, life is more than matter, energy, or DNA. And scientists still cannot properly define what life is. When a biologist tries to describe life, he describes things like flesh, bones, cells, DNA, chemical reactions. And that's our best explanation of what life is but when we see death we still have flesh bones cells dna chemical reactions so the material for life is in place here but life itself is missing so what actually is life life is intangible it's not touchable by the tools of science the answer is that life comes from god and the Lord God formed man of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. Who knoweth not in all these that the hand of the Lord hath wrought this, in whose hand is the soul of every living thing and the breath of all mankind? So this is a tremendous gift that we have that our life, as surreal and... and uh, mystic as it may seem since it's not something that can be touched by the tools of science is actually a part of the creator himself that's been dis dis bestowed upon us he's breathed into our nost nostrils the breath of life it's a tremendous gift that god has chosen to to give us life and as we look at the nature of the human body when a, when a biologist looks at the human body and he notices that it's made up entirely of base and trace elements, all of them being found in the earth, 
then that means and that, that, that tells us that we are basically the same thing as a rock. We're made from dust. A rock is solidified dust. And my body is also solidified dust, just uh, in, in just a little different form with a lots of H2O in it. And so because of this, we have to wonder if I'm the same thing as a rock, uh, there's, there's no extra ingredients besides the, the minerals that are found in rocks and, of course, the spiritual connection, then why can I think and why can I be consciously aware that I exist? And why can I ponder the things of life? And, of course, this is a troublesome thought for those that don't believe in God, that that want to disagree with the statement that life comes from God and we get our consciousness from that entity that's created all things. So it's no wonder that we enjoy life if, if this life is a, a gift from the Creator. It's no wonder that we appreciate sunsets and we are overcome with emotion when we hear a baby's first cry. It's no wonder we're filled with joy to see an old friend. It's no wonder we feel plunged into a deepened sense of reality and awe when viewing the magnificent heavens. It's because these things were created to bring him pleasure. Revelations 4.11 tells us that. And when we notice these things, the life giver's purposes are being fulfilled and by extension, our lives are being fulfilled as well. And it's no wonder as well that we become guilty and we feel condemned and discouraged when we rebel against the source of life because this is our life, God himself. So if we rebel against that life giver who is loaning us life, our life will be filled with all sorts of tor turmoil and trouble because we are working against the very life source in our bodies. And we're attracted to God because of this. And He possesses those things that we feel in need of and desire the most. When we draw near to Him, this life source, we experience them. We have uh, a, a fundamental need for love. This is the first point. We feel, and we feel love deeper and stronger when we're close to God. We feel a need of acceptance. That's the second one. We have devastation without this. When we're close to God, we feel such a strong sense of acceptance that we feel little need for acceptance from others. Thirdly, we have a need for worth, and we want to feel substantial. We need to be careful with this. You know, we realize that we're nothing of ourselves. But what more effective way of feeling a sense of worth and value than being joined to the infinite Creator God? We need a sense of purpose, fourthly. When this is lost, we simply can lose even the will to live. God is the ultimate purpose of the entire universe, not just the stars. The universe includes everything that's been created. The, the entire universe and the spiritual world, He's the reason that everything exists. If we lack purpose, we must be lacking the life from which purpose originates. All right. Moving on from here, I want to move back into astronomy. And as we look at that, we'll I'll put up the first part of Psalm 19 here. But let's look at the actual purpose of astronomy that it's talking about here. The heavens declare the glory of God, so they have that purpose of declaring God's glory. Some men don't see astronomy as having that purpose. What is the purpose of these flickering points of light shining out of the inky back blackness in the night sky? And I'll just go over something that I've written up a few years ago. For some, they may, may be only a distraction as they rush inside to crouch before a glowing screen. The attention pan, span they hold is too short to reach the stars. To them, they're only an unchanging white dots on a motionless black veil. After all, the stars are there every night, right? And when something is repeatedly and endlessly presented before us, we tend to become uninterested and unmoved by it. Others see more because their sense of wonder is never satisfied. They have the intrinsic ability to soak in the reality of what they're observing. Things in nature are always more alive and realistic to them because they hold an acute 
awareness of what's before them. All of this culminates into a crescendo when they gaze upward into the expansive dome of the heavens. Now, astronomers see things, sees things a little differently. He, with his fertile, imaginative mind, will not see just the white dots, nor will he simply see stars, but will be acutely aware of all the mysterious celestial objects that fill the glistening night, like the comets, quasars, magnetars, pulsars, meteors, black holes that sees unsuspecting stars, and the parading planets that orbit the shimmering stars. And this entire cosmic realm is inundated with intense radiation in the form of gamma rays, x-rays, and ultraviolet rays that erode dust veils, light up gas clouds, and shape nebulae. At times, this astronomer sees so many components that he misses the whole. So absorbed is he in the deep, deeper specifics of the cosmos that he looks beyond and misses the nature of the simple beauty at the surface of the stellar dome. Some miss the very point of the heavenly host reflecting the glory of their creator, someone much greater than the shining lights, but consider the stars to be an end in themselves and imagine that they reach all the way across the empty void of space to touch them with a stealthy influence that controls their own lives. As the signs of the zodiac pinwheel overhead these astrologers pore over their futile horoscopes in hopes of finding their fortune or fate locked up in the secret of the stars. There are still others that fearfully and suspiciously looked for the sun and the Milky Way to come together and form a galactic alignment. This was supposed to co coincide with the December 21st, 2012 end date of the Mayan calendar. But it's unfortunate the, that these misinformed people had been hoodwinked by the doomsday prophet into believing that an apocalypse was coming to change the earth as we know it on that date. But this type of an alignment has no effect on the earth. In fact, the Mayan calendar was slightly off and the alignment had already occurred sometime in 1998. What happened? Nothing. Like the Bible says, seed time and harvest, day and night, continue on on this planet as it waits the return of its maker. So what are those flickering lights there for? It depends on who you ask as we see these four groups of people. But the one who made them gives the correct answer. He revealed to us they were made for his pleasure. What he takes pleasure in, he wants us to delight in as well. They were also made for our profit to show times and seasons and to reveal to us the powerful attributes of our creator. The earth was not made for the universe but the universe for the earth. Once again, Psalm 19 reads, The heavens declare the glory of God, the firmament showeth his handiwork. Day unto day uttereth speech, night unto night showeth knowledge. There is no speech nor language where the voice is not heard. So this message is going out throughout all the world and giving us a profound revelation of our Creator. Men longer ago, the ancients, they noticed this unique aspect of the heavens that causes us to be drawn to a sense of awe and wonder. And because of that, they named those lights after they, their gods, or they actually treated those lights as gods. Here we have Saturn, Neptune. These were named after gods. Over here is part of the Omega Nebula, part of the Carina Nebula. This is part of the Orion Nebula, part of a glo globular star cluster over here. These are all actual images and so for that reason I have an R logo down here that you can see at the bottom of the screen that is a composite of images but they're made of real images so whenever you see the R logo at the lower right of the screen you know you're looking at a real photograph and now the exception with this one is that it's a composite of images that have been put together into one and this just kind of shows you how I did it it took individual images of some of the planets and dust clouds, and I put them together into one uh, composite like this. So we believe God created these things. We don't believe they're responsible. Uh, we, we don't believe that there were other gods responsible for the creation of them. We don't believe these things are an end in themselves and they control our lives. We believe that there was a beginning and God spoke 
and these things happen. This is something we accept by faith, but it makes perfect logical and reasonable sense. So this is something that is not hard for us to accept. But some men who do not have lives that are right with God find this extremely hard to accept. And so to answer the fundamental question of life of why are we here, how did things start, they had to come up with a good explanation outside of what we read in the Scriptures. And so the most common one or popular or, can we say, um, easy one was to say that the universe has always existed. So in that case, it doesn't need a creator. And the universe is a type of God in itself. It's just always been here. Well, there's a problem with that. And that problem was becoming obvious, painfully obvious to, psych- to uh, astronomers, um, you know, close to 100 years ago. They started to look up into the heavens with their giant telescopes, and they'd see things like this, the Helix Nebula there in the background, where this star has actually uh, puffed off shells of gas and dust and expanding out. This is a sign that the star is going through a life cycle, and it's aging, and it's waxing old as doth a garment, just like the Scripture says. And they look at other stars, they see them running low in fuel. We can see the, the, uh, the evidence of stars moving from a, a hydrogen-based nuclear fusion onto a helium-based nuclear fusion, and we go on down to heavier and heavier, heavier elements until we get to the point of the star attempting to burn whatever is left and once it gets to iron iron doesn't burn very well in a nuclear fusion reaction or combine and so the star actually implodes on itself the explosive force stops the star slows down dramatically the star's outer layers layers collapse inward and soon the pressure and heat increase to such a dramatic proportion as the inertia of these collapsing gases pile in on the core of the star that the the star explodes in a supernova explosion and a brilliant flash of light is emanated that can outshine all 100 billion stars in that galaxy single-handedly and the star blows itself to bits and it's over with. We see that happening over and over again. So this universe is growing old. This told us that the steady state theory that the universe has always existed is fundamentally flawed and so astronomers were forced to come up with a new theory for the universe and it was a step in the right direction because it actually conceded that the first phrase in the Bible was true. So, so we agreed with this but then we stopped here. So what does that theory look like without God and does it work? Does it make sense? It's called the Big Bang Theory and it could be summarized into the belief that there was nothing, and nothing happened to nothing, and then nothing magically exploded for no reason, creating everything, and then a bunch of everything magically rearranged itself for no reason whatsoever into self-replicating bits, which then turned into dinosaurs. And there you have it, the modern-day adult fairy tale of our marvelous universe. This is impossible, and I don't need to stand here and tell you that zero times zero equals zero. You understand that. But here we had neither pre-existing matter nor pre-existing cause, and we get everything from it, the entire universe. It's like saying that we would stand here and recreate this Big Bang explosion. Let's just replay this, and we have this void of space in front of us, and we're, we're going to move back 15 billion years ago before there was any type of universe, according to the evolutionist theories. And so we, we sit here, and we wait for this universe to appear. And it doesn't happen. We wait for hours, months, days, years, decades, millennia, billions and trillions of years go by and nothing happens. Well, the the reason for that is because there is no trigger to start this explosion. We realize we need a cause for the effect of the universe. But there is nothing here besides nothingness. So that's it. We take some of the nothingness and cause it to happen to nothing and we have our universe. Of course, it doesn't make sense. It takes less faith to believe in a God than to believe in a causeless universe like this. There's lots of other things we could look at in the Big Bang Theory, but we'll just move on. Um, 
as far as problems with the Big Bang Theory even getting off the ground. But if, as soon as this happens, there's another tremendous theory, uh, problem, and that has to do with the, the distribution of light across the universe. Light has a speed limit, and it can't just travel uh, to any place and instantly. And now, of course, that brings up a question of how can we see stars that are farther away from us than a 6,000-year travel time? Well, there's ways that creation astronomers have found that light could get right to us without even violating the laws of physics was just as another, uh, saying, another way of saying that God wouldn't have had to create a miracle to get light to us. But there's not even a tenth of the amount of time needed in the 13.7 billion year Big Bang time frame to get light and heat evenly distributed across the universe as we see it today. So the uh, solution for that was that and the problem is called the horizon problem. The solution that astronomers gave for that was called the inflation theory. And that states that the universe experienced a faster than light expansion short, shortly after the Big Bang. So the Big Bang happened, the universe was expanding extremely rapidly, but all of a sudden, denying the or uh, defying the laws of inertia, if we can say it in that way, it underwent an, an increased expansion rate. Extremely rapidly expanded. It expanded to such a great deal as well, 10 to the 78th power times bigger in size. Now that means that the number is 1 followed by 78 zeros. That's the number that represents the number we're talking about. And so the universe expanded that many times bigger from almost an infinite speck to an enormous void in, let me give you the amount of time here, one quintillionth of one femtosecond, which is one quintillionth of a millionth of a billionth of a second. Now, that's hard to believe. It was just like an instant pop, and, and there the universe was enormous. And then it gracefully reverted back to the original expansion rate, and we have what we have today. Have you ever, you, you may have seen the illustrations of the Big Bang, where there is a, as you go down the timeline, there's this small point that starts to expand, and there is a large basket-shaped expansion, then a, a normal expansion again. That's what that's explaining. But, you know, the interesting thing is there's not a shred of evidence for the theory. It's all conjecture. Back in 2014, a team of astronomers claimed to have found some evidence for that theory, but it turns out that they were completely wrong because what they thought was in the cosmic microwave background was simply just dust in our own galaxy, a local effect. And so they're back to square one without evidence for the theory. Now, of course, when the supposed evidence was found, it made headlines across all the major news outlets as far as I know. It was publicized, but later when it was found to be a fraud, the response was just a whisper. It shows the bias. Why do we accept things like this? Why do we subscribe to theories like the Big Bang Theory that are in their uh, fundamental state foolishness? Well, this here may explain a little of it. I'll give you a quiz here. This question is simple. Which square is darker, A or B? Now, in this, it looks like we can make a positive statement and build off of this without any problem. So we'll go ahead and do that. A is darker than B. I won't ask you to, to tell me because that's obvious there. But before we move on, I want to build a bridge from square B up to square A and watch what happens here when I do that. And you see that it looks almost like they're the same shade now. Now, some people look at this and they say, well, it looks like there's a gradient here that as we go across the bridge from B to A, the bridge is slowly getting darker to match the shade of A. But that's not the case. The reason we think that is because we're influenced by the outside surroundings here. So I'll take all of that away. And you see we're left with two blocks and a bridge that are exactly the same shade. Now let me back out of this and I want you to keep your eyes on here and see that there's nothing happening except for the bridge being built and the objects uh, appearing or disappearing. So this tells us we can't trust our own faculties. 
we thought that we could build a positive statement on that, but we were entirely wrong on such a simple-seeming illusion. That's what it is, actually. So we can't trust our own physical minds. And to make matters worse, there's a God of this world that's continuously trying to cloud our vision, capitalize on our uh, vulnerabilities to draw us away from our Creator. So once again here, we'll build the bridge, we take everything else away, and it becomes clear what truth is. Sometimes we need help like this to be able to correctly interpret truth. So we need a basis for truth in life, and that, of course, comes from the Scriptures, the Word of God. There's lots of good things the Bible has to say about life. It's, it's pertinent that we have this in our lives. It's imperative. The Bible also talks about astronomy, and we'll look at a few things that it has to say about astronomy. Lots of interesting things, things that are important, things that were not accepted years ago, but today they are. And that's what we'll, those are the Scriptures we'll look at here which alone spreadeth out the heavens and treadeth upon the waves of the sea, which maketh Arcturus, Orion, and Pleiades, the chambers of the south, which doeth great things past finding out, yea, and wonders without number. They're past finding out, which means they're beyond our comprehension. We can't even count the number of stars. I'll try to remember to tell you this evening about how many stars there probably are in the universe. Up here it says, which alone spreadeth out the heavens. What does that mean? Well, we'll look at a few more of those in a, a few more scriptures it is he that stretcheth out the heavens as a curtain and spreadeth them out as a tent to dwell in in isaiah 40 22 there's about a dozen references to this stretching and spreading out of the universe he that created the heavens and stretched them out i even my hands have created the heavens stretched out the heavens that stretcheth forth the heavens alone who stretcheth out the heavens like a curtain stretched out the heavens by his discretion. Over and over again, the scriptures are telling us this. It seems almost like we're moving beyond a metaphor here, and this is something that actually happened. Well, it turns out that it is. Astronomers have found in the middle part of last century that as we look at galaxies far away from us, they are actually moving from us. And the farther we look out across the universe, the faster they seem to be moving from us. So this tells us that the heavens are being stretched the objects aren't just moving away from each other, but the very fabric of the universe that we call space-time is being pulled apart. It's being stretched out, just like the, the scriptures say. Now, back at the time when this was written, the universe was considered to be pure, perfect, and static, unchanging. The ancients, of course, observed that the planets and comets moved across the sky, but they thought the stars were all fixed in place, and they did not move. And so this was heresy to the contemporary philosophy of Isaiah's day and Job. But of course we see it's true because it was inspired by God. Over and over again these statements are being made that defied the current understanding of the way the universe was. Another example here, Job 26 verse 7 says, He hangeth the earth upon nothing. The earth is hanging with no visible support whatsoever. And this is contrary to what men believed longer ago. Some thought the earth was carried on the back of a giant called Atlas. Others thought that the earth was carried on the back of four giant elephants. And these elephants, of course, were standing on a turtle, since turtles figure fairly prominently in Hindu mythology. Now, the Hindus, this sounds a little comical, but they actually took it further than, I think it was the Greeks did, because they thought of it that, you know, the, the, the elephants need to be on something. And so they put the elephants under on top of a turtle. But the poor turtle under four giant elephants and a, an entire planet, what's he going to do? He's going to be crushed, right? So the obvious solution to this was let's just put him in an ocean of water. But now we have this entire body of water to deal with. Where did all the water come from? And what is supporting this ocean of water? This just goes to illustrate that when we reject God's ways and His commands and what He says about the nature of our lives and the universe, we only compound our problems. And it's so very true. We also see in Isaiah 40, verse 22, it is He that sitteth upon the circle of the earth. The earth is round. It has a spherical shape like this. It's not flat like men believed longer ago. This was written sometime between 740 and 680 B.C., which makes it 
uh, about 300 years before the philosopher Aristotle first suggested that the earth might be round. And then it was another 2,000 years later when the scriptures inspired Christopher Columbus to try to sail around the world. So once again, we see a statement that was contrary to what the ancients believed. Here's another one. Hast thou commanded the morning since thy days and caused the day spring to know his place? Speaking about the earth here, it is turned as clay to the seal and they stand as a garment. So this is giving us the picture of the earth turning. Turning as clay on a potter's wheel or a seal rolling across the clay, stamping out patterns. So this is definitely another illustration that shows us the truth of God's word and how it, how it can be trusted even in scientific matters, even though admittedly the, sci the Bible is not a science textbook. The ancients thought that the universe orbited around the earth once every 24 hours. Today we know that the earth is turning within the universe once every 24 hours, giving us the appearance that the sun rises in the east and sets in the west and the stars follow suit at night. Of course, today we are, have this modern understanding along with what the Scripture says. We also have an example of the number of stars. At, about, at, a, at a time when about 5,000 stars could be counted in the night sky, the following statement was recorded. As the host of heaven cannot be numbered, neither the sand of the sea measured. So men thought that they could count the number of stars, but Jeremiah says, no, we can't. Telescopes show us that this is true, and we'll talk about that number later on. Stars are compared to the sand on the seashores, as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is upon the seashore. Modern science tells us that these two numbers are actually very nearly alike, just like the Bible compares them together. Man discovered in the 19th century that all matter is made of indiscernible atomic particles. And the scripture says in 11, Hebrews 11 verse 3, through faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things which were seen were not made of things which do appear. We have the matter and energy constant uh, fits into the famous little equation E equals mass times the speed of light squared. First law of thermodynamics the most firmly established law in science, and it states that the total quantity of matter and energy in the universe is a constant. We can take one and convert it to the other, but the total quantity is always the same. So creation is finished, just like the Scripture says. Genesis 2, 1 and 2, Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God ended His work which He had made. Second law of thermodynamics is a very well-established law that states that everything in the universe is deteriorating, running down, and tending to disorder. Just like Hebrews 1, 10, and 11 says that they shall perish and thou remainest. They all shall wax old as doth a garment. We are running out of time here, so I'll just uh, skip over a few of those things. And we'll look at Ecclesiastes 1.10 where the preacher, as he called himself, Solomon, said, Is there anything whereof it may be said, See, this is new, it hath been already of old time which is before us. This verse could be an example of how these so-called new discoveries are not so new after all. They were recorded in the Bible long before they were discovered by modern man. This solidifies the biblical authority on even scientific issues. So, the Bible and science agree there's a perfect harmony between the two, between God and His natural world, because He created them. He created the laws of physics, and we can see these laws, we can see the universe, enjoy it, and learn from it. So that gives a basis of what the Bible has to say about astronomy, and we will continue on with the rest of it this evening. I think that's all I have for this morning. We could kneel for prayer at this time. Dear Father in heaven, we thank you that you are great, far above all our comprehension. We know that you are righteous and holy as well. We see your nature and the universe around us. And we at the same time realize that you are a personal God and that you love us and that you care for us tremendously, and you want to be a father to the fatherless. 
and you realize that we are all fatherless in one way or another. All of our fathers have failed us in some way, even though they want to be faithful, yet we are orphaned in some areas of life. And so we thank you for your blessing and your promise to be there for us, to lift us up and to raise us and, and to set us on our way and enable us to do the work of your kingdom. We thank you for the meaning and purpose that we can have in life from believing in you and connecting with our life source, our life giver. And we pray that this could go on as we go from here and as we interact with others in our day-to-day -day life, that we could show your love and show your mercy and your grace. And we pray for your strength and that your, your goodness would be displayed through us. We thank you for the other for the uh, things that we learned in the Sunday school period this morning and the devotional and the topic after the Sunday school. And we pray for those that are at a lot, that are experiencing loss in other parts of the world. And we pray for the, the ones that have been going to help out. We pray for the group that's going tonight. We ask that you would bless them and strengthen them as they go. Help them to be uh, almost as, as angels sent from you. And we pray, Father, that you would also bless this congregation. Thank you for the privilege we've had to worship together this morning. And may your will be done in our lives. In Jesus' name, amen.